Hi, I'm JB Jones. And I'm Bella Naiman. And we're the co-founders of NYC Jewelry Week. We are excited to welcome you to our sixth year, New York City Jewelry Week 2023. Welcome to our virtual talks program. On our YouTube channel, you'll get to enjoy incredible content that we've put together for you with the theme of iconography, looking at the past, present, and future of jewelry. You can see the full schedule on our website at nycjewelryweek.com, and we invite you to explore all the programs there. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hiya, hi. <laughs> I am going to introduce you, Emma Picole. Emma Picole is um, an amazing jewellery artist, designer, maker, and she's based in London. And isn't your studio in the Goldsmith Centre? Yes, it is. And for those who don't know, that is an amazing building full of the most talented makers that we have in London in the craft of jewellery. Yeah, so hi, Emma. It's nice to see you today. Hi, and I introduced Simone Brewster, who is one of the best <laughs> makers, designers in the world. Oh, <laughs> wow. She, yes, Simone. Um, and um, she practices from her London studio and is basically incredibly talented, multidisciplinary artists who you will see more and more of. So welcome. Yeah, thank you. High five, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah. It's the truth. <laughs> so um, I just thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about one of your um, more high profile projects that has uh, landed um, in the last 12 months. Um, you were the jewellery artist behind um, another Cole, Michaela Cole, not the same family. Mm -hmm. Michaela Cole's um, cat, uh, I wouldn't say catwalk, but it's not the catwalk, it's the it's the Met Gala, isn't it? Yes. Um, and tell us a bit about how that even happened, because when you told me first, I was just like, what? <laughs> how did this even take place? Yeah. And then you went, there was a lot, there's a lot more depth happening in, in that uh, project than just making the final pieces and the beautiful mm -hmm. objects that everyone gets to see. So um tell me a bit more how did the how did the, you find out how did they approach you did you approach them how, what happened no i was actually in here in this office uh and it was where are you tell them are we, tell I'm, them at, where are? I'm at the vna in south kensington in my the office and Albert museum yes yeah. um i wear a few hats and right now i'm wearing my curator hat um so i was here I think it was late afternoon and I received a phone call saying that Michaela was going to co-chair the, the Met Gala, the 2023 Met Gala in May. And she wanted to wear jewellery made by me. And we, we both share um, British Ghanaian, well, I was born in Ghana and I moved here when I was 12. And I believe Michaela was born in Britain, but she's of Ghanaian heritage. And so we share that. Um, nice. we have that in common and she particularly wanted to wear jewellery made by a Ghanaian artist with gold from West Africa and mm. so it was very short notice so the first thing I thought of was amazing but then I thought do I have enough time to do this how short how much time what was the lead up four weeks what? Yeah. I didn't know that. Four weeks. I thought you had eight. That's Six including eight. that's including the actual dates of the Met Gala. Wow. So you had four weeks to did you have a concept? Did you have to design? No, a I had to start thinking immediately. Yeah. Um and stressful, stressful. And then I also had to be in Ghana the day after the Met Gala. Oh yeah. For my apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that I definitely couldn't have mm -hmm. anything to interrupt with. Yeah. Um, so I had to get to work straight away. It was it was crazy. But I have to say, I it, and it could be a, 
it is toxic. I just thrive under insane pressure. That's the only way I get things done. Like I need a tight deadline. Otherwise, I can just be dreamy and coast. I'm like, it's going to be done. It's going to be done. So it was stressful. But what really did help, although I, I was, I think I was think I was thinking along the same lines as Michaela. But what helped was when we spoke to her stylist, and I said, "Can you tell me what Michaela wants?" And she just said, mm. "She wants to be dripping in gold." And I actually had already started sketching pieces that would appear that she was dripping in gold, so it was mm. perfect. And um, and I I had to, it was it was a challenge, but it it came together. And I think what was beautiful about it was the the weight of the pieces the sheer, the amount of gold that I had to work with. You know the, the, you know the, the numbers, the figures. Oh, so how many of you were, so, like, I saw she had some of the bracelets and the earrings were really quite big. Yes, yeah, so the, the cuffs she didn't wear. But, um, so no, it's, it's, um, it's amazing because the pieces are still living and they're still being worn by so many other women. And I just find it, the story of where the gold comes from, the women, the amount of women involved in actually getting that gold to my my bench. Um, and also the teamwork, because although it sounds like I did all of this by myself, I actually had mm. an amazing team. I mean, you, you were there, just being able to speak and to speak to you and other people in during that time was a stress relief. <laughs> I think um, it's really important to talk about the team mm. element of things because um, when you think, you know, when we work at the end, the finished one object gets made or a series of objects that are kind of, they exist then in the world by themselves mm. and in their own right. But how things are made is often a mystery, especially yeah. for people who don't make. Yes. And, also, as a maker, we're all on this like journey of improvement. So what I think is really nice about, well, being in this kind of industry, but also when I hear how you work and how other people grow and improve, it's kind of like you've got this idea or this project and then you start making and then you might hit a wall or you might not know how to do a particular detail. And then we can reach out to our community and basically they come to our rescue often or they help us learn and grow. Yeah. And they are equally as important when it comes to documenting the history of that particular piece. Mm. I think you have um, companies and, and makers who would never credit people who assisted in the making of the piece. Mm. I, I don't need to take glory for stone set i i learned stone setting but why would i <laughs> yeah, yeah. In when i can be making other things and someone who's actually high so much more skilled in that than than me i want the piece to be the very best and i if i can't be the best person to make a particular section of it then i will go to the best person to do it and that without that person the piece doesn't come to life it yes. just remains an idea. And so yeah. it was really nice to have in the Goldsmith Center, I had Benjamin Hawkins, I had Jessica Jew, I had Leo, um, my my neighbor Leo helping me. Um, the a Viper designs who cast the pieces were yeah. amazing. Peter got on the train to hand deliver the gold. I mean, it was a huge amount of gold. So Yes, it was it was a really nice project to be a part of. And and the yeah. story continues with the pieces. Mm -hmm. And and the, the video that the um the women in Ivory Coast made speaking about the gold and, and what it meant to them to see pieces made with that batch from the mine to the red carpet is just really it's touching. Yeah. And it goes yeah. to show because though that those voices are also erased by the yeah. time we get the metal. Yeah, yeah, so that's really, true. Yeah, so it's really beautiful to keep that chain alive and communicating and 
just to let them know how important it is the work that they're doing because without that we can't create with metal. No, you don't have the foundational materials just to yeah. even begin. Yeah. But I am going to ask you <laughs> because you've just been on fire. You've got you've had your um exhibition at the Mad now Mad gallery. Mad. Yeah. And then you've got these amazing installations and all the stuff you've been doing with cork. And and on top of it, you've got a baby. <laughs> yeah, it's not he's a toddler now. He started to walk, so we can't call him a baby anymore. But no, yeah. but you did all of this whilst he was he wasn't walking. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I remember visiting your studio and he was um strapped to my body still and I was yeah. working on these projects. But yeah, it's been um, it's been an interesting year, I guess, and um, it's been pretty full on. Um, more can't say yeah, I'd say more like sixteen months. Um, it's been pretty full on, but definitely transformative. And um, each phase and each project has given me something new. So the Now Gallery exhibition was amazing because um, I. <laughs> The thing about us makers is we often are in our own worlds and our own bubbles, isn't it? And we're making them, we're bringing things into the world. And once they're here, we're kind of like, and what now? What does it mean? And so I've got this back catalogue of work and given the opportunity to have this solo show. And I have so many different pieces and we have to find a way to translate what it is I do because I work in, you know, I work in jewellery, yes, but I also started off in... I studied architecture and then I went to furniture, made sculptural objects and furniture. And then during lockdown, I started painting. And so we have so many different arms and how do we introduce this to people and get them really to understand what I'm doing? And um, what's really interesting is actually the role that Junior played or plays in my practice. It's like, I'm, I've said this before, maybe I shouldn't be saying this in jewelry week, but it's, I find jewellery the most difficult um, of the any prep and any of the disciplines I take on. It's jewellery is always the hardest. Is it because of the fine the the skill of it? Yeah, it's like you have an idea mm. and you think, okay, I'm gonna just make it like this. And it's always this balance. Like by the time it's in the world, it's a balance of your skill level, your money level your time level and you know just the physicality of making it and the idea that you can damage this thing that you've been you know it's 95 percent made but you can always damage it on that last five percent <laughs> i always think you know it's the it's the small details as well that make something come to life and um what was really amazing for me with the now gallery project was having this opportunity and the support system in place so it wasn't just me. I had this team these of curators I could talk to who were, you know, they were just believing in me. Oh, yeah, you can do it. It's like, okay, I can do it. And um, ended up making some of the hardest pieces of jewellery that I've ever made. Um, I do have, this is one of the pieces here that I've made. I love that piece. That piece is an articulated Love it. Oh, look at it. It's... um. So it's in, the body's in silver, but it's got like a vermeil finish. Yes, it's just um, beautiful. You can, you can maybe see the ebony, this, yeah. and then I've done the strands. This is um synthetic here that I plaited and gave little beads at the end. Yeah. Um, And there's this, you know, without going into the narratives in my work, it was really important for me to have just have the the hair as part of it ah. and, the, and the ebony yeah. um, bead instead of using other precious stones and I thought that was great but the skill level in me having to make that was, <laughs> was fun. because we've got in the VNA collection and mm. that would be up available on um, search the collections very very soon um, we have a similar piece but that has leather yeah that's based off of my early 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 it's one of the first, first pieces of jewelry that you yeah. made yeah, yeah right. so seeing that sort of evolution from that the piece that we have here and this piece and the movement yeah. i i yeah it's really beautiful to see 
Um, and um, why Ebony? Um, so that to... is a whole bigger conversation. That's actually what drew me into making jewellery, actually. Um, I was on a, I was visiting with a friend who was going to a factory in Norfolk. So that's a location in the UK. And um, whilst we were, it was a wood factory. And whilst we were going around, the guy was talking to us about different things. And then we came across this material, this like, just about this long and about an inch by an inch or 25 mil by 25 mil, depending. And um, I was just, what is this? What is this? It smells amazing. What is it? Oh, this is, is this, that's ebony. Those are sticks of ebony. What? This is ebony. Wow. It's so dark and blah, blah. And I got like to drawn in by this material. And I said, I'm going to make something with this. And they're like, sure. Yeah. Go for it. And um, the only thing that I could design and make for that scale was a piece of jewelry. It was actually, I think this is, yeah, this is from the first collection. Oh, I just bounced it. Wow. See this. But you know how I know it's from the first collection? Because I didn't know how to make jewellery. And I've used this all wood making technique. So this has oh. got like a spigot here. Yeah. That's yeah. the pin that goes into the wood. Yeah. And this band isn't cast. It's been turned. And I'm trying to capture it on the camera. But I don't think I it's can good. see it very clearly. There's little lines here on the inside mm -hmm. where, where the metal was turned on a lathe. So how did you rivet the... Yeah, it's called a spigot. Basically, you put, it's a kind of rivet, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, so, so there is a connection because I'm thinking riveting and then you're saying spigot. and Yeah, yeah the spigot is the, the prong that comes out, but I didn't know. It was just basically, it's, um, it's a furniture making technique that's been used. It's like wood turning, the wood's turned and the, the metal's been turned and they've been attached with mm. um, this pin and... Yeah, that's how they, they held together. And I I love this idea of taking this material and making the gem, the the whole the whole design based on this kind of wood, because I was questioning at the time, or I guess we can say questioning this, how we treat the concept of diamonds, you know, when diamond is a material that can be made man-made you know and it's so highly regarded i wouldn't even say within the jewelry industry i think it's for people who don't know as much about jewelry if i'm honest it's like a, the commercial idea of what jewelry is yes. so for the people who aren't heavily involved and invested in jewelry mm. when they think of jewelry they say diamonds yes whereas people in the jewelry industry will list the whole might bunch of other things when they think about precious jewelry yes. um but for me at that stage that was also where i was at so i was like why do we value diamonds in this way and i took this kind of um idea of the cut the color and the size as the start point and translated that into wood so i wanted to cut the surface of the wood to, sh to reveal the grain and i combined it with some of the rings have a different um a different wood with it so you have diff different colors coming together mm -hmm. and then I wanted them all to be really large so the size was a really bold and impressive panel let me see if I can take this one out without rustling too much this was this has got to be oh, wow. so this is lignum vitae at the top which is also really closely grained wood mm -hmm. and then at the bottom for all of the turning as well so that was my first venture into it and that the idea of this value and how we value materials um, was central and pretty much was why I ended up using ebony and why I still use it now because I feel like we can't make any more ebony trees. It's super no, precious. No. It's, it's so lovely. rare. Yeah, and it's beautiful. So I just wanted to treat it with the kind of respect that I think it deserved. It's so interesting when we um, think about value, because mm -hmm. I, like you, when I um, started to, when I left university, which is when the real learning for me exactly. began, <laughs> like you're on your own, um, it, you don't really have much money, 
unless yeah. you come from a super wealthy background you yeah. you have to start from scratch and yeah. so silver back then i thought was the best thing to use and i i didn't even realize that silver was still quite expensive in comparison to bronze and brass and well, just you know Emma, when i started i started in copper that is where I started because you could make the scale of the pieces that I wanted to make. Mm. If I was going to come out and start making that in silver, I was just, it was shocking to me. It was like, I just yeah. can't even look at those figures. And it's crazy yeah. because, you know, you, we're talking, we started off talking about a project that you made, which are really big pieces in gold. And I think it's part of just, yeah, in a way, it's kind of a maturing into the, practice of jewelry it's yes. kind of good they don't just let you work in gold when you come out but it's also really it makes it really hard mm. and you have to be more clever I feel like definitely so I went straight in thinking okay I had a day job so I can pay for silver and so I was mm. casting all these heavy and you know my pieces are not tiny pieces no, and yes. I was casting all these pieces in silver and I thought I think I had a conversation with one of the casting, some someone at the casting company, and they said, why don't you cast them in bronze? And so mm -hmm. I did. And I then I found oxidizing bronze is such a beautiful experience because it yeah. really takes on the most amazing patina. Some you can't actually yeah. achieve with, with silver. Mm -hmm. And so then I went from silver to bronze to silver to gold and and now I work in all of them depending on, mm -hmm. on, on the project and I think they're all very beautiful metals to work with and so this whole notion of value for me I spend the same amount of time on a bronze piece as I would on a gold piece no you don't it's harder to work in bronze be serious because yeah, it's a true. type of material it's hard to work in bronze I it is I, I but, it. it's really tough but in terms of from start to finish mm. i am actually spending so it the the only thing it falls down it comes down to when you're pricing is the material value because my time yeah it's the same yeah it's the yeah. same um and then again back to diamonds like you said it's usually people outside of the industry, but we do actually have people in the industry as well who think diamonds are the be all and end all. But I, I worked for Marcia Lanyon for a period of time before I decided to go back full-time making jewelry and selling gemstones really opened up a whole new world of colored gemstones, so much mm. more rare than diamonds. Mm. And I realized it's, yeah it's so it's just so much more beautiful to work with mm. so-called semi-precious mm, yeah yeah i mean yeah it's, it's, there's a there's a whole world of conversation like we had around how we mm. like why we'd call something more precious than the next but yeah but i find it interesting with you where you've gone from architecture to product design and then gone into jewelry yeah the, um old masters trained the other way around oh but that's actually why i find jewelry interesting because i feel like so when i was studying architecture we learn about what i call when i'm teaching i call like the ingredients of space right planes lines openings vistas blah 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 these things are the tools that we play with when we're designing spaces to make spaces feel a certain way this is how I talk about it when I'm teaching at least. Mm. And so I had this understanding. And then when I started to make with my hands, I shouldn't say started to because actually when I was, I've always made, and that's kind of what got me through my architecture degree. And when I, and that period of time was that I would be in the workshop making, I was in the making unit there and I loved working with materials. So, um, this idea of making has always been a part of it but i think what happened when i started to make jewelry was it really focused me in on concepts of value personal value and then when you start to make things with your own hand you develop a visual language that's yours 
So even with even if I gave you the exact same brief that you know this conversation around diamonds and I said design something that explores the cut color and size of a non-precious material or a non-precious material a precious mm -hmm. a material other than diamond in reference to diamond design a collection you design something completely different to me and make something because you're coming at it through your lens of what precious is your value system of what precious materials are mm -hmm. and your skill set and making level as well so when you combine those things it becomes your own language. So when I zoomed in, when I went, mm. and I started to make jewellery, I really developed my personal visual language. And then I was able to come back out and start making things at larger scales that still had the lessons that I learned when I was at the jewellery scale. So how I wanted to combine materials, how I wanted to describe adornment, which in architectural world is pretty much Dead. we don't adorn things anymore you know like we used to so mm -hmm. how can we develop languages of adornment in a minimalist society kind of thing and, and what was nice what has been nice is in my solo show I was able to do to play with that I was able to take things languages that I developed at the jewelry scale and make them spatial scale like large and have it become like central elements within space and to create architecture out of it and have people actually understand that and not just be like, what is this? They they yeah. they inherently understood what was going on. They felt it both as architecture and this link back to the jewelry. So yeah. um the journey from the from the jewelry into the space, I think has it's been central in kind of making me the designer and artist that I am today, mm -hmm. basically. Honestly, just walking into that space of your exhibition, mm. every single thing was considered. <laughs> I, and I, I thought, when, where did you find the time to do this? It was, but you're, you're training as an architect really, really true. And the way that you, the, just the way that you handle the space to perfection, and then I was measuring your necklace here because I needed to put everything onto the system. And I was sitting with a colleague of mine and as I measured, I, was, I just said to myself, she's definitely an architect. It was just perfect. The, the, the measurements, everything. I don't measure anything. So just <laughs> yeah, but you know what's interesting is, what I find really interesting is um, it's always when you talk to someone else about your work, how they perceive what's taking place. Can I say it like that? What I guess what I'm getting at is um, I, I see the imperfections in my work because I'm way too close to it. Yeah. So if I would have measured it, I'd been like, that is like, that's half a mil. Just, you know what? It's so annoying because you yeah. didn't. But also, I guess that's why those frustrations are probably why I keep on coming back to making jewellery because I want to be able to make something perfectly. I don't know yeah. if it's even possible. No, I agree with you. And and I remember when I first, I've had a few clients who are architects and the very first one I thought, that's interesting that an architect would like my work. Mm. And the second and third and fourth, I thought, what is it? Because mm. I'm not deliberately being perfect, but <laughs> yeah. but there's something that appeals to architects about my pieces, which I still am really baffled by. I would say um, having some knowledge about that that uh, discipline, um, we kind of have to acknowledge that they are restricted so much there's so many restrictions on on what mm. we can do when we're working in the, the architecture realm that this idea of freedom is really appealing <laughs> so you've got the, your pieces are really bold they've got like a, a sense of scale about them and yeah. so it touches on that element but then it's got freedom that i think that they kind of Actually, that's a really good um, place to follow on from, freedom. How, I think what we have in common, we have many things in common 
And one of those is actually being able to do what we want. Ooh, when it that's to always read. an interesting thing because doing what you want, yeah, there are pros and cons to that. I think we have to, you have to put yourself in a position with your work where you understand what you can get back from from it at, you know so how what am I trying to say yes as if you if you've got a really distinct language that doesn't find a very comfortable place in the existing market um you're not going to make money straight away from your work yeah. and I think there's I think people if that's who you are I think that's who we are you just have to get comfortable with that. Yeah. But the other side of that is if you keep making, you develop a body of work that's really distinct and then the people who do buy into it or feel an affinity with it, they will buy your work. It's just going to take longer. It does. So it's a longer investment. But once that kind of coin is flipped, it's kind of mm. much easier from that point. But it's definitely, for me, it's the way... The thing that made sense. Yeah, Just... it's, it's not an easy, I think the way that we work, the way we choose to work, actually, I don't know if it's a choice. I think it's just being us naturally. Mm. It's not, um, it's not driven by money to make, I have to make this piece to sell. Is driven by the need to create. And so when you yeah. do that, there's a sense of freedom that comes with it. And yes, obviously we all have to live, and, but we make other, um, we, we, we have other means of doing that. But because it's a real passion and yeah. you have to bring the pieces to life, mm -hmm. it's, it's just a slower way of, of living, of, of earning if you do end up selling but it's so it's i just find it very uh, rewarding and i i'm happy for all the jobs i applied for when i left university that i didn't get i think i was saying something like that today really really mm, very similar something very similar to that mm. um it's not that I, it's actually not that i'm happy i didn't get them it's more that i'm happy that i had to go through a period of resilience um, of, of opposition I'm glad I didn't just find my place because it really it made me have to hone in on my craft and understand what I was trying to achieve yeah. why I was doing it realised that it's not just about me in a way mm. and you know there's just a lot going, it makes a lot more sense um, now and than I think it would have if I just left and everything came to me i think i can i really understand all of the choices that i make now um and where it lives in my practice and why it's necessary for me to keep keep making yeah. and doing yeah. yeah but it's interesting because in the moment it just feels painful <laughs> i just want to stop i just want to stop why doesn't it just fall into place and it's kind yeah. of like yeah. it is it's, it's not it's it's pain it really is painful um, but I look back and I think yes, it was meant to happen that way because like you said, I would, we wouldn't have been able to, to get better when, when you, when you sort of walk into it and it's, it's just there on a platter, mm -hmm. what else do you have? And I think with people like us, we just have to continuously push ourselves. And I think I'm, I mentioned this to you, I struggle when doing a business plan and there's like a competitor analysis. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I'm not looking left or right. I'm just trying to think, how yeah. do I make this better next time? Yeah. Is it, what is the purpose of this? This will survive and outlive you, you know, hopefully forever. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. When you think about, but I think just generally speaking, that that approach has been super helpful for me. And I, I kind of worry about the generation coming up that have grown up in a world of Instagram where things are always presented in a polished way. And it's like, if I, may, if I, when I talk about my journey, how I got to this point, it literally makes no sense 
it makes sense in hindsight. I can make a story out of it and I can make it so that it's all good. But living that up and down, mm. not seeing what's coming um, around the corner mm. has been the biggest challenge. And ultimately, it's just, I think the reward really is for hanging on there and hanging in there is having, you know, these moments where you get a phone call from a method call. When you get when you get these big opportunities, when someone comes and says, I'm going to the Met Gala, make me look gorgeous, you know, that is that doesn't happen every day, but when it does happen, you feel like, yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you recognise my my what I've put into this kind of thing. Honestly, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's it hasn't been easy, and we're still going. I think we're still well. For, I class myself as very much still at the beginning yeah. stages, mm. and um, I think for for you, it was obvious that you you had a great talent at you know, at the RCA. I mean. No. No, no, no. I actually disagree. I think no. this is no, and this is, I think, this is dangerous. We should never talk about people like this simply because it's we're all there are so many things, there are so many decisions mm. that, and so much support. And having talent is the focus is should be on talent, but talent is not what gets you across the finish line. No, no, but. What I'm saying is, it was there from. I remember when we spoke about your interactions with Michael Rowe, for instance. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Right. Yeah. So it's it was there, and it's nurtured by people like him, which is yeah. so so yeah. so important, because exactly. you have the opposite, where you've got people at universities who are dream killers. Oh, that happens. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's so yeah, that's so. Do you true. see what I mean? So yeah. having the right, um, yeah, the right teachers at university yeah. to help you along the way, mm. it, I think it's really quite special because honestly, I don't understand why these dream killers go into teaching. <laughs> when it's like you're just snuffing people's lights out yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it I takes think... a special resilient kind of mind to to think about what they said and think well, actually no I can do I can do this that takes a lot of inner strength mm. there are some people who are very very good and they have they have yeah. all the talent but just that one or two negative no. seeds yeah. planted kills kills the dream i know but that's that's not the fault of the individual it's really the system that we need mm. to be we need to be careful with but that's also you know it's, it's the luck of the draw as well that i had a good supportive family that made it really easy shouldn't say really easy <laughs> nothing was easy but it was i was easy to know that they were going to be there for me regardless mm. of, of what happened um yeah, and I and I I do think I was lucky with the Royal College, um, Royal College of Art to have the tutors I had, um, and the experience of going there, um, and just I went there to have fun. I didn't really think about what I was going to do next. Yeah, and maybe that's why I was able to have fun and uh, learn as much as I did when I was there. So, mm. yeah, I think asking. Asking the right things at the right time of yourself is really important as a maker and as a designer yeah. because we often ask the wrong thing at the wrong time and that's actually what can stop us from accessing our creativity and getting the best out of the opportunities that arise. But yeah, in that opportunity, it was just like, I'm just going to go and have as much fun and knock on as many different departments as possible and learn as much as I can. And that's pretty much what I did, yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. No, that's... um. It's a rare mind, Simone. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, I remember when we went to, we went to an exhibition. Yeah, the White, White, Cha White Cube, White Cube Gallery. Yeah. White, White, Chapel White Chapel Gallery. White Chapel, yeah. And there was, um, I think we were looking at women in the surrealist movement. I believe that was part of it. 
Yes, and we they, we came across a cabinet and it had sketchbooks and other works by yeah, artists. Yeah, that was really good, yeah. And I remembered looking and I said to you, Simone, this will be you one day. <laughs> and you yeah. said, oh, no, no way. <laughs> I still say that. I, still say that. No, I disagree. Mm. I disagree. We'll <laughs> And in a way, it doesn't matter because my the way I look at making and this kind of crazy journey we're on is it's really easy to get caught up in the idea of what's going to happen next and really just have to focus on now and doing the work. Yeah. And um, that's it. And that's what but I try also, to Also, for me, in relation to that, is the fact that you are you are and are going to be an inspiration to so many young um, women, um, especially like young black women, mm. if they wanted to do this. Um, and I think it's just amazing to see someone who works across disciplines and you're able to do it. It looks effortless. I know it's not. I know mm. that there's a lot of work um, behind it, but you do it seamlessly. Well, I'll take the compliments. And that is compliments. it's very hard. Um, but I think it's also natural because what, what's happened is we've just got this conversation in and it grows slowly as I learn and to, able to take on more material knowledge and making knowledge and um yeah, it's it's good. I look at it like um I if I look at someone like Louise Bourgeois, that's what I always say is like yeah. She was working until she died at 99, right? Mm -hmm. That's and the goal, like, yeah. Yeah, that's the goal, right? <laughs> if that's the focus, the focus is to keep making good work. Yeah. And if I can make one good piece of work to represent each year that I'm on the planet, I'd have some good work. Mm. Good. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Can I just ask you what it is about cork? that um, has drawn you in, moving from Ebony and so on to Cork? Oh, so I've done these large scale sculptures. I don't know how to share screen, unfortunately, otherwise I'd probably... Um... Oh no, but that's the thing, Simone. Anyone who's watching this has to go and do their own research. We can't spoon feed. Oh, right, okay, fifth yes. fifth place. Because we um, were not spoon fed. No. And so research Simone Brewster, Dot co UK. Exactly. <laughs> That's what you're finding. But um uh so that was a that was an amazing opportunity. London Design Festival got in touch and they wanted me to well they didn't I don't know what they wanted me to do really. They put me in touch with Amarin, who are the largest cork suppliers in the world, they're a Portuguese company, and they were like, make something, and I was like okay this is amazing Let, let's let's see what happens I had I had all these ideas but I was also very heavily pregnant at the time maybe nine ten months I can't remember I was quite I was quite pregnant yeah. and Amarin wanted me to fly over to Portugal and I literally I was like I, I don't even think I could get this I'd have to go and get like a special permission from my doctor and everything you know just like this isn't going to happen so we ended up delaying it for um a year roughly until after my son was born and um, I flew over with my family, my husband and my son, and my husband's a tree surgeon. So he, when they took us to the Cork Oak Forest to see the forests out there, it was really, really, really good. Amazing. And that's when I was like, okay, I'm going to just scrap the ideas I had. I'm going to have to talk about what it is they're doing in this material. And um, it's a pretty amazing material. And what they were doing, what they're doing is trying to grow more of it and encourage people to um, think about how it can be used in architecture and products. And obviously it's in their benefit because it's a, they're a court company, but the money you learn about the, the benefits that it has for the environment, it makes it really, really exciting material for me yeah. to use. Yeah, so that's, why, that's one of the most recent things I've been um, playing with. Um, and let's see where it goes. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. It's always, it's always a journey. And then finding its home, in I've made these sculpt, the, these sculptures have been made two and a half meters high in this cork material. But what happens after that, and how it sits within my practice, we'll we'll see. I don't know if it's going to 
feature in jewellery, it might just feature in furniture and large objects, but the material is pretty amazing. So it might just become mm. something that I have to experiment with and figure out how to make it mine, if that makes yeah. sense. Mm. Yeah. Can't wait. Let's see. Yeah, it should, I don't know, should we close it there? What would you like to say? Is there something that we can leave the people um, with? I... Do you have any more questions for me? Well, I, I always ask you what you've been up to. I don't know if it's a valid <laughs> question, but I always want to know what you've been working on in the studio. Ah, uh, I, um, so I had Goldsmiths Fair. Yeah, you did. Recently, and um, I'm sort of in between, there are new pieces I made for Goldsmiths Fair. There are lots of unfinished pieces on my bench as well which I really do need to um turn my gaze <laughs> towards uh and I, I can see there's definitely a shift in my work where Why? what's happened I think it's because I've had that time to spend away from the bench ah. in the museum, mm. also um, going to Ghana just being able to think a bit more to, I think it's really, it's been useful to just come away and then rethink why am I doing this? Because I, um, obviously I have these sources of inspiration for me, volcanoes and erosion and memory, they're all tied in. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be making a caldera ring forever. And so I've only got... <laughs> specific number that I'm making that's it and I want yeah. to see that growth and you know I want to see my work evolve yeah. one thing I wasn't doing um and I sort of pieced it back to my actual emotions that the even though they are volcan volcanic um pieces and eroded pieces they they were essentially parts of how I was feeling as well you know suppressed mm -hmm oceans and eruption and so on but what I'm doing now is make, going a bit personal like actually translating my actual real feelings <laughs> into jewellery really yeah so that's... things that I've gone like transitions in life mm -hmm. into jewellery um okay and when can we expect to see this yeah um when and now well, there should be the one piece that I'm... Oh, actually, you haven't seen the gourd. You saw the beginnings of the gourd pieces. Yeah, I'll send you the pictures. The earrings are stunning. So be... they'll look beautiful on you. I have to make you a pair. And um, so I've got those uh, finished. Um, and then there are other pieces that are more... I don't necessarily want to explain them to everybody. So very yeah. few people will get the meaning. Mm -hmm. because I'll tell mm -hmm. them but to to the rest of the world it would just be a piece of jewelry and there are things happening but I don't necessarily have to go into why it's very, yeah that's interesting how there's narratives in the work but it, people will always have a response to it yeah but you don't necessarily have to go always into the depth of all of the no. narratives no. yeah it's you great. don't um, so doing that and also working on, on larger pieces because my, my favourite thing at university when I was studying was silversmithing and I can't wait mm. to work large scale um, metal pieces and sculptures so mm. Mm. ideally that's the route that I'll be going slowly, slowly but um, yeah we'll see. Space mm. is obviously limited, um, equipment mm. as well. I mean, to be honest, I'm in I'm in the Goldsmith Centre and and we have <laughs> yeah. you need to do what yeah, I do, very... look on some doors, look on some doors and get people to exactly. Um it's time. I think my my issue now is time and well, being spread time. thin, but I mm. think it's it's great to have that problem and I'm not I'm not complaining. This is it. I I, I, I am complaining, but I know that I shouldn't. <laughs> I, that's the difference, I guess. I might now I'm just like I really I really, I shouldn't say I do have a, 
a, a, a 15 month old son I really do want to sleep a lot more but yes at the same time, I just have to keep on going Exactly. And that's the thing. Last thing I think we should both speak about perhaps is how we juggle motherhood. And um... <laughs> that's a big yeah. one. Yeah. It's, it's because you have that whole other life and humans that you're responsible for. Yeah. And then you have to work. And for us, it's, it, they're both, all of them are full time positions. Mm. You can't be a mother part time, you're not a yeah. wife part time. No. And yeah, yeah. I think um, this is the. Yeah, I think that being we all know this. Like, I became a mum like fifteen months ago. Uh, shouldn't say it like that. Like, yeah, we were born <laughs> fifteen months ago. And um, this is part of making it see it sound so easy or look easy. <laughs> I just had yeah, a baby yeah. fifteen months ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, the thing is, uh, so many, I, the way I look at it, so many things changed. And there's no real way of preparing for this. They say that when a child is born, a mother is born too. And that's very true. And you can't really hypothetical it. It's just, it just is, it turns out being what it is. Um, and uh, with so much changing, so many people and women have been like, how have you managed to, how have you managed still to put together this show? Or how have you managed to do this piece of work? And it's like, you know, what I realized was that um, so many things change and so many things were out of my control. My body, my schedule, how many times I'd have to wake up in the night, how little sleep I had, you know, like literally, I can't, but meeting friends, I used to climb, three, four times a week. I've not been climbing since my child's born. Actually, it's before because I wasn't climbing when I was nine months pregnant either. But, you know, so many compromises change and mm. time restrictions and all of these things happen. Transformations with my physical body, not even the idea of being vain, but just I, I was living in this body for a while. This, this is just how I thought it was. Mm. You have a child. So that changes. And for me, creativity was the one thing that was there before I had a child that was still there after I had a child. So when it was about, I don't know, making a piece of jewelry, doing a painting, responding to a design, a design brief, <clears throat> it wasn't, that was home for me. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. That was home for me. I could really go there and feel totally myself. Yeah, so it was very, it was much easier for me to do than I think. Mm. People look at it almost like another thing to do. And for me, it was much more like um, a sanctuary. Mm. It was a sanctuary. Mm. Yeah. Sorry about the coughing. I'm not crying because of what I'm saying. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's well, fine. <laughs> you okay? Yeah, yeah. I'm good, yeah. It's definitely a sanctuary. Um, yeah. So my 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 story's the opposite of yours. Okay, go for it. The children. Well, um, my first um, came, and then I started to do this, and then my second came, and I continued to do it. And you're right; it's that place where I can escape to because being mum came so naturally, and then this extra thing that I can escape to and and do and just immerse myself into it I get lost in making mm. completely mm. lost and so now I, I, I completely get it although it's the it's sort of the back to front way of doing yeah, yeah, yeah. it yeah yeah it's it's it that same. before but it was there afterwards and you realized it was your sanctuary as well it was there before the the creativity was there, but mm. the um Out the, yeah, it's just how events happened. Mm. Um but it just it just sort of grew and and 
how can I put it? Yes, it, it grew with my kids. That's yeah. exactly what happened. It just grew side by side. Mm -hmm. And it's still growing. Um, and yeah, hopefully we will be like Louise, working yeah. with you. Yes. Yeah. Hundred. <laughs> I'll take it if I can if I can get it, I'll take that. Definitely, definitely. But it's honestly for me, it's such a blessing and an honor to be living during the same period as yeah. you and some other amazing, amazing, amazing makers. I think yeah. there's a lot of fantastic makers living now, and it's a great time to be mm. to be um to be alive in terms of making. Let me make yeah. that very clear. There are, many, <laughs> there are many problems in the world, but today we're focused on making. So yeah. thank you, Simone. It's been lovely yeah. speaking with you. You too. It's been great. And uh, go and check us out. Where can we find you? What's what? Where can I find you on socials and what's your website? Uh, MFACole.com. Yeah. <laughs> and where are you on Instagram? Uh, MFACole Jewelry. Mm -hmm. And the English, um, the English spelling of jewelry or the American jewelry, English spelling always yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, um, I can't, I it's, it's just how we were brought up, my love. We just spell it yeah. the way we spell it, yes. Cool. So, jewelry, uh, the British uh, spelling, and yeah. um, I, yes, I'm here and there, nowhere and everywhere at the same time, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very similar, yeah. Yeah. How about you? Where can we find you? Uh, yeah, SimoneBrewster.co.uk. And uh, I've got a separate website for my jewellery, SimoneBrewsterJewellery.co.uk. British spelling as well for the jewellery. Yeah. And I'm on Instagram. You can find me at SimoneBrewster underscore London and Simone Brewster Jewellery as well. Amazing. And I can't yeah. wait to buy a piece of your jewellery. I'm not sure you have to, my love. Just come and ask. Okay, we'll swap. Okay. Yeah, we'll do a swap. Do swaps. <laughs> okay.